Welcome to the third podcast of this series, brought to you by Physical and Health Education Canada, that outlines important education principles that support teachers to foster the development of physical literacy among students. My name is Ishan Angra, and I will be the host for today's podcast. The podcast was developed by the Centre for Healthy Development through Sport and Physical Activity at Brock University. Located in St. Catharines, Ontario, Canada, on behalf of PHE Canada and Sport Canada. Individuals who are physically literate move with competence in a wide variety of physical activities that benefit the development of the whole person. Quality physical education programs provide one of the most effective ways to foster the development of physical literacy amongst children and youth. Over the next several months, we will be examining various teaching strategies that educators should consider when fostering the development of physical literacy amongst their students. Using the acronym EDUCATION, we will examine one teaching strategy per podcast that highlights important pedagogical strategies that can help teachers implement a quality physical education program with physical literacy in mind. In today's podcast, the U in education will be our focus. In the education acronym, the U stands for understanding. A quality physical education program will foster student learning by enabling students to understand movement. Students can then analyze, communicate, and apply their knowledge and understanding across and within a wide variety of physical activities. This level of understanding not only improves the quality of an individual's movement, but also enables individuals to move intelligently and proficiently. To help illustrate how to foster understanding, the Teaching Games for Understanding or TGFU approach will be highlighted throughout this podcast. Since its introduction at Loughborough University in the early 1980s, TGFU has received considerable international attention. To date, there have been five international conferences devoted to TGFU, the most recent conference hosted at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, BC. As a learner-centered model of teaching, the approach is intended to provide learners with an understanding of the technical and tactical skills necessary to be successful across a wide variety of games and the motivation to continue to participate. TGFU has become a well-used model that has been infused into provincial curricula for delivering games across many Canadian provinces and also has great potential for the implementation of Canada's long-term athlete development plan. When TGFU was first introduced in the 1980s at Loughborough University in the United Kingdom, it was in direct response to the prevailing approach to teaching games during the 1960s and 70s. Thorpe and his colleagues noticed that when students left physical education programs at secondary schools, they were not proficient game players. The system at the time focused heavily on the outcome of games. Students knew little about how to play games proficiently. And while many had good technical skills, they had to rely upon the teacher or coach to tell them what to do during a game. Today we might call such students as being physically illiterate based upon their lack of understanding of how to communicate and apply their skills to game situations. One of the basic premises that makes TGFU an ideal model to foster the development of physical literacy is the grouping of similar games together based upon their common characteristics. Rather than teach discrete formal games in isolation, learners begin to foster an understanding of key fundamental concepts associated with game structure that they can then transfer and apply to numerous types of games. Learners soon begin to recognize similar rules, skills, and tactics that they can transfer between similar types of games. Four game categories were created that group similar games together. The first was target games. These included formal games such as bowling, golf, bocce, and curling. These games share a similar principle in that the performer is required to propel an object, preferably with a high degree of accuracy, at a target. These games only include sending away type skills, and the use of defensive tactics are often limited. The next category is net wall games. These games require individuals to propel an object, usually by striking it, into an opponent's space so that they are unable to make a return. Examples of formal net wall games include tennis, volleyball, squash, and CPAC TACRA. 
These games typically require more sending away an object that is in motion, such as a tennis ball or volleyball. Both offensive and defensive tactics are equally important, as individuals or teams must try to score points or defend an area. Fielding and run scoring games include formal games such as baseball, cricket, kickball, and stickball. The object in these games is for the fielding team to strike an object, usually with a ball and an implement such as a bat, so that it eludes defenders in the field. The batting team then tries to score runs by either running the bases or in between wickets. Fielding and run scoring games use both sending away skills such as batting or throwing a ball, as well as receiving skills such as catching a ball. Offensive tactics are designed to increase the chances of a batting team to score runs, while defensive tactics are designed for the fielding team to work together to prevent the batting team from scoring runs. The final games category is invasion games. These include formal games such as soccer, sledge hockey, basketball, and European handball. As the name would suggest, the objective of invasion games is for the team in possession of an object to invade another team's territory in order to score by placing the object into a forced target such as a net or across an open-ended target such as an end zone. Invasion games require the use of all forms of manipulation skill categories. These include sending away skills, receiving skills, and unique to the invasion games category, retaining skills. Retaining skills include skills such as dribbling a soccer ball with feet, or a basketball with hands, or cradling a lacrosse ball, or stick handling a puck. Since the team on offense, for example the team in possession of an object, shares the space with the team on defense, for example the team without the object, offensive and defensive tactics are often complex and dynamic. For a complete breakdown of each of the four games categories, and the common skills and tactics within each games category, visit the instructional video section of the PlaySport program. There you will find a video with a detailed overview of each games category. But when do we get to play the game? How many times have teachers or coaches heard this from children and youth during their classes or practices? Often this question is dismissed as an indication that the participants do not want to work on developing and improving their skills and would rather just play a game. However, if you listen closely enough, this question may actually provide important clues into the types of knowledge and skills that students require to become competent game players. Perhaps the participants do not fully understand why they are taking part in a particular drill or activity and hence will not be able to transfer the skill back into a game. Perhaps it is an indication that the participants feel they have already practiced a particular skill and are ready to play. It was this kind of thinking that resulted in the original six-step curricular model proposed by Bunker and Thorpe. The first step of the model is likely what made TGFU unique at the time and continues to make it a unique approach to teaching games. Bunker and Thorpe suggested that a form of a game should be played at the beginning of a lesson. This is not to suggest that a teacher or coach should play the formal game first with all the formal rules enforced. Rather, step one of the model is for the participants to play a lead-up or developmental game that introduces them to the main objective of a lesson. Sometimes the first game may reinforce a particular technical skill that will be refined throughout the lesson. Sometimes the first game may reinforce a key tactical component that will be emphasized throughout the lesson. Or sometimes, the first game might introduce a key life skill, such as teamwork or communication, that might be reinforced across the lesson. By playing the game first, the learner soon develops an appreciation of the game and the various components. For example, the rules, skills, and tactics that make up the structure of the game. This better prepares the learner for step three of the lesson, where the instructor helps the learner to develop an awareness of how to apply their knowledge and to better understand why they are doing what they are doing, so that they can transfer this knowledge back into the game. By the time the learner reaches step 4 in a lesson, he or she is better able to make more intelligent decisions about how, when, and why to apply a skill or tactic within a game. It is not until step 5 in the lesson that the instructor focuses upon helping the learner to refine the technical aspects of a particular skill. 
The advantage to waiting until later in the lesson to hone in on skill development is that the learner will better understand why they need to work on the technical aspects of a skill and will be more motivated to do so. The final step in the original TGFU curricular model is to apply what they have learned throughout the lesson in a culminating game. Again, this game is typically not the formal version of a game, but rather smaller developmental games that maximize opportunity for the learners to demonstrate their new level of understanding through performance. Although the TGFU model is likely best known for starting a lesson with a game, the most important feature of the model is what is in the middle, the learner. Every game, every drill, every activity that is used within a TGFU lesson is centered around the needs and developmental abilities of the learner. Hence, games and drills are modified to suit the individual and not the other way around. There's a common saying within TGFU that kids are sacred, games are not. Since the introduction of the original six-step TGFU curricular model, a more common three-step model has been adopted due to the often short instructional time period that teachers and coaches have during a class or practice respectively. This three-step model, like the original model, starts with a lead-up game that is developmentally appropriate for the learners. Technical and tactical skills are then further developed and refined, and then the lesson or practice ends with the learners having the opportunity to apply what they have learned throughout the lesson or practice in a culminating or developmental game. The following video is an example of an Invasion Games lesson that follows the three-step model. Invasion Games involve controlling an object, keeping it away from an opponent, or moving it into scoring position. These type of games can be modified to be simple running games or to use specified skills such as kicking or throwing. To begin working on the subtask of maintaining possession, the warm-up activity for this lesson is called Can't Touch This. Can't Touch This is played within two badminton courts or same sized grids. Each team has an end. Using a frisbee, the offensive team is trying to pass the frisbee five times in a row. The defensive team is trying to block and gain possession of the frisbee. Players cannot move when they have the frisbee. If a team gets five passes in a row, they score one point. If, after five passes, you can throw the frisbee to a partner and he or she catches it in the end zone, the team gets a bonus point. The teams do not have to immediately score the bonus point and can keep passing between teammates. After a point is gained, possession of the frisbee goes to the other team. Skill development in this lesson involves four levels. In level one, partners practice stationary passes with the frisbee. The teacher provides individual feedback and instruction to assist in the improvement of the quality of movements and skill development. Level 2 involves partners practicing passing the frisbee using the flick pass. In this example, the teacher provides a thorough explanation of the skill to match the knowledge of the students in the class, then allows the students to work in their own time. Again, the teacher is consistently making herself available to provide individualized instruction. In level 3, students pass and move while their partner is walking in the grid. While students are moving throughout the space, safety should be stressed. Finally, level 4 involves passing while a partner moves quickly to a new spot.
Because level 4 involves students running throughout the space, safety must again be stressed. Four vs. Four Ultimate Space Frisbee is the game used for skill application of this lesson. Break students into even teams of no more than four, and create a playing grid with pylons. Place hula hoops at each end of the playing area, and inside each hoop, place a cone marker with a ball on the top. Play begins with both teams lining up in front of their respective end zone lines. The defensive team throws the frisbee to the offensive team. Players may only take three steps with the frisbee and pass or throw at the target within five seconds. Players without the frisbee may not use any body contact to get the frisbee away. If a player succeeds in knocking down a target, a point is scored and play begins again with the opponent's team having possession of the frisbee. If the player does not succeed in knocking down the target, each team attempts to gain possession of the frisbee without body contact and the team who gains possession makes passes and takes steps towards their target cone. In the previous video, a number of pedagogical principles were used. While these pedagogical principles are specific to implementing a TGFU lesson, they are also very effective at fostering physical literacy. The first is the pedagogical principle of sampling. The intention behind sampling is to encourage teachers to not only expose students to all the games categories, but also to sample from within a games category. For example, in this clip, ways to maintain possession in the Can't Touch This Game are highlighted using a frisbee. Teachers can substitute the frisbee with a soccer ball or lacrosse stick to highlight that tactics used to maintain possession are similar across a number of games within the same games category. Students soon develop an understanding of the similarities of games within the same games categories, which in turn increases the chances that they will be able to participate competently in these games. The second pedagogical principle often used in TGFU lessons is game representation. Here, instructors create developmentally appropriate game-like scenarios that demonstrate how a particular skill or tactical solution is used within a game. For example, in the skill development part of the Invasion Games lesson, the participants are practicing throwing a frisbee in a way that represents how the skill is used in the game. Using a developmental progression, they start by working on the technique of the backhand throw followed by the flick. After they have had the chance to practice technique for both these throws and receive feedback from the instructor, they continue working on their technique, but in a way that is representative of how the skill is used in the game. That is to say, they throw the frisbee to a partner who is moving first slowly and then quickly. The third pedagogical principle is exaggeration. Here, the instructor creates a scenario that exaggerates a particular component of the game. For example, in the Invasion Games lesson, the focus is on maintaining possession of the frisbee. To score a point, a team must successfully complete five passes in a row. By including a rule that participants cannot move with the frisbee, it forces their teammates to move into the open position to receive a pass. It also encourages the participant with the frisbee to use short passes to teammates who are in the open. In other words, the game creates a scenario that exaggerates the tactical problem of how to maintain possession. Participants soon understand the variety of tactical solutions that are needed to keep possession of the object in order to score points. The final pedagogical principle common to TGFU is that of tactical complexity. Much like there is a developmental sequence in the way that participants learn skills, there is also a developmental progression in the way that participants develop tactical understanding. Within each games category, there are some tactics that are more complex than others. For example, in the Invasion Games clip, the tactical problem being exaggerated is ways to maintain possession. After introducing this concept in the initial lead-up game at the beginning of the lesson, and providing participants with an opportunity to develop and refine their throwing skills in ways that were representative of how the skill is used within the game, the final culminating activity included the use of a goal. If after getting five passes in a row, the team could then attempt to knock the ball off the cone. This progression 
from maintaining possession to a more complex tactical problem, such as how to attack a goal, forms the foundation for understanding the major tactical problems and their solutions across the entire game's category. Many of these concepts across all the game's categories are highlighted in a new book entitled TGFU, Simply Good Pedagogy, Understanding a Complex Challenge. The book, edited by Canadian researchers in British Columbia, is a compendium of practical and research-based articles written by presenters at the 5th International TGFU Conference hosted by the University of British Columbia in May of 2008. The book is available through PHE Canada's bookstore at excelway.ca. In addition to this Canadian book, a special series of articles were published in PHE Canada's journal Physical and Health Education Canada, leading up to the International Conference at UBC. In particular, Issue 73, Volume 3, contained a number of practical articles for each of the game's categories. In summary, TGFU is an effective way to foster understanding as part of the development of physically literate individuals. Given that learning is an active process, TGFU fosters understanding of games by playing games. This is not only more motivating for the learner, but it also enables individuals to transfer their game understanding across a number of different games. This is an important feature in the development of physical literacy. Secondly, learning is developmental and takes time. Hence, TGFU breaks games down into their simplest format and then increases the complexity of the games as participants begin to gain a better understanding of the games. Third, learning is contextual, and students need to understand how to apply their knowledge within a game. Through the use of pedagogical principles, intelligent game performers are fostered, which in turn enables learners to make decisions on their own rather than always relying upon a coach or teacher. Fourth, learning particularly within sport and physical education, is social and should be inclusive. Students develop an understanding by being engaged within the game's environment. Hence, small-sided lead-up games that maximize participation of all students and are developmentally appropriate are most effective at fostering understanding. Fifth, learning involves language. Understanding the language of games enables learners to read the game effectively. By understanding the interaction between rules, skills, and tactics, both within a game's category and across the game's categories, increases the chances that students will participate competently across a wide variety of games. Finally, motivation is critical in learning. Because TGFU is a learner-centered model, teachers and coaches are encouraged to ensure that the challenge of activities within a lesson or practice match the skill level of the participants. If the challenge is too low, participants will be bored. Conversely, if the challenge is too high, participants will be frustrated and experience anxiety. Finding the right balance is critical to foster understanding of games. This concludes today's podcast. Our next podcast will focus upon the importance of character in the development of physically literate individuals.